My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. You're listening to the new Mutual Audio Network. Welcome home. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that all children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. Hello and welcome to the Sonic Society, the world's largest showcase of modern audio theatre and sometimes audio fiction. I'm your host, David Alt, and my co-host Jack will be back next week when he's better rested and filled with Easter joy and perhaps just a little bit of chocolate. This week it's Sonic Society number 684 as we begin with Shadowwood, The Curse of Nolan Folgate with Aidan Dixon and Jenna Rose, and a couple of audio fiction pieces including The Promise by Glenn Dixon and 1101 Wellington Way by Vivian Lamond and Hand to Mouth Theatre. And all three of those features begin right here on the Sonic Society. You are listening to Shadow Wood, The Curse of Norton Forgate. <sighs> and I don't doubt, but they will drop and fall all together. In good earnest, and never to rise again. That's it. I've done it. How utterly depressing. I read every single book in the Shadowwood collection. Well, except the fiction prisons. Interesting thing, fiction prisons. Did I ever tell you about... Ah, yeah. Forgot about this place was empty. Everyone's out living their normal lives. Still, I'm out of books. I suppose I have to start using my library card again. Hello, welcome to the Guildford Library. Is there anything you're looking for in particular? Oh my god. It's really you, isn't it? Gracie? You remember me? Yes, I do. I figured out you were trying to slip me those amnesia pills when you left. I mean, come on, Norton. What were you thinking? I was a bloody psychiatrist, and you didn't think I'd be able to recognise medicine? Yeah. I'm sorry. It was for... My own good. You said that a lot, you know that? It's been, what, 35, 40 years? I'll tell you, I was furious when it happened. My whole life turned upside down because of you. Never any explanation. You've got to let bygones be bygones, however, or else you'll drive yourself mad. So what can I do for you, then? I need a book. The phrase, no shit, Sherlock, comes to mind. You're in a library. Do you 
need it for our case or something? Nope. It's for leisure. So you finally got through the Shadow Wood collection then? That's... Every Wiley published book since the 1800s. Yeah, I've had a lot of time. You'll want to be looking in row 37 then. That's where we keep everything rare and obscure. Thanks. My library card is still valid, yeah? Yep, still valid. Thanks again. I really am sorry about everything. Sure. Some of those books are one of a kind. They're kept behind glass. You need a key. Oh, right. I'll be a while searching for books, so we could have that talk now? No, no. Library is shutting soon anyway, and we're the only people in here. Shut in? It's only 3.30. Blame the council. Here we are. Row 37. Come on then, let's get it over with. Why did you run away a few days after proposing? It was... If you're about to say the words, it wasn't you, it was me, you can leave. It's true though, you can't understand what it's like never to die. All your life is so linear. There's a path laid out for you. You have a decision. But I don't. I keep on going. That shared fear, that shared destiny, I'm just not part of it. Sometimes I don't feel human. And when we happened, I wanted to make it work. I really did. There was times I thought it would work out. But every night I see you in my dreams, your throat torn out by some monster that followed me back from Shadowwood, or lying in my arms at 80 years old, while I still look the same. I just thought it would be better for both of us if we didn't have to deal with that. You could have at least talked it through with me rather than just trying to drug me into forgetting you. You know what your problem is, Norton? You underestimate other people sometimes. I knew what I was getting into a few. Don't forget that I tagged along with Shadow Wood on quite a few missions. Hunting vermides, tracking down time worms. I've seen as much as anyone else on your team and yet you always treated me like I was so fragile. That's because you compared me. The people in Shadowwood signed up to fight, but you didn't. Simply by knowing me trusted you into danger. I couldn't deal with that responsibly, so I tried to take an easier way out. Life happened since then, Norton. I moved on a long time ago. And how was your life? It was extraordinary. It really was. Did you ever find anyone else? No, I've been too busy. Have you? Not particularly. I did end up meeting another immortal in a pub. But he's not really my type. Anyway, I want to know about you. Once you disappeared, I started investigating aliens and things by myself. Partly because I wanted to run into you, but partly because I just couldn't put everything I'd seen behind me. I ended up running into this little group. Turns out Shadow Wood aren't the only ones that deal with the rift. They realised how valuable I was, and so I went off with them. You'd be surprised. I helped alien families adjust to life on Earth, that sort of thing. We were funded by this eccentric billionaire. She paid for us to travel across the world and do all sorts of crazy stuff. I joined the library because I heard that there was an infestation of giant space bugs, but by the time I started, your lot of Shadow Wood had cleared them all out. It was then that I realised that Maybe I should stay on as a librarian, just because I like it, not to save the world. I got to do all the big things, and now I get to enjoy all the little things. <laughs> but I suppose you'll never retire, will you? Just keep going on with Shadow Wood until there's no Earth left to defend. That's the curse of Norton Fallgate, I guess. Found a book yet? No. Not yet. Oh. What is it? That can't be right. Norton, what's wrong? Take a look at this book. The Curse of Norton Folgate. Have you done that? 
That's the problem. It's nothing to do with me. Oh, come on. I mean, it's titled after something I just said, and yet it looks... Ancient? And you're sure you haven't done this? I'm sure I haven't. Or at least I haven't done it yet. I hate time travel. It gets very confusing very fast. Check inside the book. Maybe you've left us a message or something. What the hell is that? I'm definitely not behind this. That looks like an artificially generated inter-universal Rosenbridge. What? It's a wormhole. Shit! <laughs> Norton? Norton! Where, where am I? Oh, Norton. You're at home with me. Yes. Of course I am. I'm sorry. I must... I must have... Have you taken your pills? Well, I was just having a blip. I'm fine. I might not be in practice anymore, but I'm still a psychiatrist. I know when something's wrong. You've been having these blips far too often. You will go to the doctor soon, won't you? I don't have much of a choice, do I? Sometimes I forget that I'm getting old. Hey, it's all right. At least we're getting old together. Just like we always wanted. So then, what's the plan for today? You mean you want to make sure they're getting on all right without us? Am I that predictable? Only sometimes. I'll go get my coat on then. Norton! Is everything okay? The... the door, sometimes... something's wrong with it. I just can't put my finger on... what? It doesn't look... well, it doesn't look real, does it? No. Oh my god. None of this is real, is it? I'm afraid not. It's all come back to me now. How about you? Yes. I remember it all. The library. The book. So, where are we? The wormhole came out of the book, so I assume we're in the narrative itself. Can that happen? Yes. Some civilizations become so advanced they can figure out how to convert someone into a fort and then lock them in a way inside a story. It's called a fiction prison. Correct. We're back. Yes, it seems we are. But this is far from over. Are you okay, Dennis? The library is closed now, but you can come back tomorrow. Who's Dennis? That man over there. He runs the bakery down the road. I wouldn't be so sure. If that's not Dennis, then who is he? If I had to guess, I'll say he's behind all of this. Correct. Come on then. Who are you? My designated name is the Timekeeper. So you're a... what? A robot? An android? Correct. Well, that explains your limited vocabulary. It also explains why you keep answering our question. So what was all that with the fiction prison? Converting me into a fort, only to bring me back. Why did you do that? Mission objective. The elimination of Norton Folgate. Ah, that's clever. That's very clever. Lure me in with a life that I never had, turn me into a story, wait for everyone to forget about that story, and then I fade away along with it. Correct. So you're some sort of assassin? Incorrect. Enlighten us then. My purpose is to travel throughout time and record the history of every person, animal, place and object in this universe. The ultimate archaeologist. 
Why would you want to kill Norton, though? He prevents my mission from being completed. My probability circuits predict that the Norton's personal history will never end, meaning that my mission will never end. I will never rest. You want to rest? So you're capable of higher thought? And part of that programming means you can't force me into that fiction prison, doesn't it? That's why you show me what it would be like, because I have to choose. Correct. This world needs me. These people, everything that comes through the rift, it's my responsibility, and I will honour that until the end of time. You will exist beyond the end of time. Yes, I will. Does that not terrify you as it terrifies me? The infinite nothingness, forever. It terrifies me all the time. I can save us both from that fate. Enter the fiction prison, and we shall be delivered from that eventuality. No, it wouldn't be right. Everyone must face the end of time in some way. We shouldn't be exemptions. So, unless you have any other ways of converting me... Correct. There are... other ways. Of course. The book. What about the book? It's ancient. I travelled along the web of time to the potential future where you decide to enter the fiction prison. I then travelled back in time and placed the book 500 years in your past. The book has been read by thousands of people. Why is that a problem? This will result in microscopic quantum schisms. The minds of the readers shall be flooded with temporal energy enough to unravel the human genome. How many? How many people are alive that know the story? How many will die? 317, including nine children. You can't go, Norton. You said it yourself, this world needs you. I truly am sorry, Gracie. I'm sorry I never gave you the life that you deserve. Tell everyone at Shadowwood I'm proud of them. Norton, no. Opening fiction prison. Norton! Goodbye. What the hell have you done? Get your hands off that book! Activating temporal teleport. Oh, back so soon, are we? What have you done with the book? The book has been placed. The timeline is secure. I will continue with my original mission. Then why are you still here? Monitoring history of object designation, Gracie Aldrin. Well, I'm not going to have a very interesting history from here on out. I'm going to sit here until I drop dead. Probability circuits deem that statement. Unlikely. No one likes a smart ass. So, Norton is nothing but a thought now? Just a memory? Memory is a funny thing, you know. I've seen a couple cases where people have had their memories altered. Usually it's as a result of trauma. The mind does it so it can carry on as usual. It's not common, but it is possible. You see, I've been exposed to all sorts of alien stuff in my time, so I reckon my biology isn't exactly stable. This line of thought does not seem logical. It's not really. In fact, I think it's pretty mad. But people can change their memories, and if not in soul, now lives in mine. And I really try, then maybe I just might be able to... This is... illogical. Oh, shut up, you! That's people for you. They never make sense, and don't I love them for it. Previous objective reinstated. No, no, no. See, when I was in the fiction prison, I did a lot of thinking, and there's a way out for us both to win. I am prepared to consider this alternative. The book has to have an autumn Vulgate in it, right? But it doesn't mean 
it has to be me. So that's it. We both get what we want. You get your rest and I'll get to stay here. Your implication is understood. And? I accept your offer. Remodeling holographic shell to appearance designated Norton Folgate. Relaying message to my creators. Mission aborted. Timekeeper units going offline. Opening fiction prison. I hope you enjoy being me, Timekeeper. God knows I do. So that's it. He goes into the book pretending to be you, the story stays the same, everything goes back to normal. Nothing changes. Well, I don't know. We've changed. Yeah, I suppose we have. Although, oh, I don't think you've changed all that much. You're still not going to retire, are you? No. Only you would rather let a robot live out your golden years so you can spend your life fighting monsters in the sewers of Guildford. I like to think that gives me a certain charm. Yeah, that's what you'd like to think. So, what happens to the book? Into the Shadowwood Vaults, alongside all the other stuff that's best left forgotten. Talking about Shadowwood, we might be needing a psychiatrist around, and you can't deny that. You've got the skills, I mean, what you just done to save me, that was amazing. Simply amazing. You always were one for flattery, but no. As much as I enjoy the adventure, I have chosen to live a normal life, and I intend to commit to that. Oh, right. Yeah, I understand. Still, it would be nice to see the old that begin. Maybe I'll pop down one of the days. We can have that coffee you promised me. Yeah, it really has been lovely seeing you. I'm so sorry. Stop apologising. Memories can change, we've established that. The only thing you need to feel bad about is that you haven't aged a day in the last 30 odd years, whilst I have enough grey hairs to... to... That one got away from you, didn't it? Oh, piss off. Haven't you got a world to save? Actually, yes, uh, I do. Oh, dear. I completely forgot about the meteor shower. Okay, gotta run. Go, go, go. You better mean it about the coffee. Go. What would we do without that man? You have been listening to Shadow Wood, The Curse of Norton Forgate. Norton Forgate was played by Aidan Dixon. Gracie was played by Jenna Rose. The Timekeeper was played by Joshua Dyer. Other parts are played by members of the cast. The script editor was Joshua Dyer. The director, Aidan Dixon. The music was by Leo Holder, Lucas Wolf, and Daniel Munoz. The Promise by Glenn Dixon.
October 23rd, 1917, Flanders Fields. Waiting for the post to come has become one of the highlights of my week now. It's a great distraction and something for us all to look forward to. I was so excited to receive a parcel from my Aunt Agnes. I've missed her home baking. The smell of her butter shortbread reminded me of my mammy's kitchen when I was wee. I shared some of it with a couple of the night nurses, which caused a wave of excitement. We tend to eat a staple diet of bully beef, biscuits and army issue jam. I'm not too sure which fruit is in it, but it has a dark browny colour. I don't think the folk back home would want to spread it on their morning toast. The scarf and socks that we Mary knitted will come in handy, as the weather's starting to change. I still haven't heard about my discharge yet. There was talk about it possibly happening before Christmas, but I'm not getting my hopes up again. To be honest, we are so short-staffed here that I can't see me getting back home until next February. I think I've made my peace with it. There's just too much to do here. The Germans have doubled their bombing raids, and as expected, the casualties have increased dramatically. On my occasional days off, when I leave the hospital tents, I'm stopped by a sentry every few yards or so, and I normally have to produce my passport. I wonder if they think I'm a spy, using the uniform of a nurse to go about my skullduggery. I rarely meet anyone who can speak a word of English, so I've been trying to improve my French. I'm struggling with the grammar and can only use a handful of phrases. December 1st. Everything is still in short supply here. Clean clothes, medicine, bandages, soap, food and sleep, especially sleep. I miss my own bed so much. I really don't like sleeping in an army sleeping bag. I know I shouldn't complain, especially when I'm in a safe dry tent, when so many of our boys are freezing in rat-infested dugouts. The night times are by far the worst. The deafening lullaby of the German artillery constantly keeps me awake. Men of all ages screaming and sobbing and calling for their mammies like frightened wee boys. We take on most of our wounded at night and there's always a constant stream of badly injured men stretched in on an hourly basis. We do our best to try and make sure that every injured soldier is given the appropriate treatment. But this is not always possible. Last night we had 23 soldiers to tend to. I rolled bandages, folded slings, sterilised instruments and tidied the operating stations. As always, the cracking of machine guns and rifle fire continued all night long and never ceased until dawn. December 4th. Our medical tents have been moved again and are now pitched on soil that has been recently evacuated by the enemy. We keep finding their personal possessions scattered around the site. Helmets, books and exotic-looking tobacco tins. One of our younger nurses, Elsie, found a small carved wooden box and inside was a photograph of a young blonde woman and on the back there was an inscription in German. One of the older doctors translated it. Decken Sie davan, das versprechen Sie halten. Remember to keep the promise. It made me start thinking about this promise and what he'd vowed to keep. To be faithful to his sweetheart. To look after himself. To stay alive and come back in one piece. It started me thinking about the promises I'd made. And more importantly, the ones I'd broken. These poor souls on the other side in the muck and the mud are going through the same anguish and horror as our boys, with families anxiously waiting for their safe return. December 9th. Today, a German airship bombarded one of our hospital tents and totally destroyed our medicine stores. Thinking the raid was over, our matron Sally Edwards bravely tried to salvage what she could from the wreckage and was hit by a stray piece of flying shrapnel. 
It killed her instantly. They are making arrangements to send her body back to her family in Wales. Before the night shift, we all gathered in the mess tent and sang one of our favourite hymns, The Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and i love that old cross where the dear is stand best for a world of lost sinners was slain <laughs> sally was very strict but was quite popular with all the staff. She liked a nip of the good stuff and kept a small silver hip flask tucked inside her uniform. If she took a shine to you, she'd offer you a wee dram after a long night and tell you about her family's farm. She was kind and thoughtful and I considered her a friend. December 12th. Our field hospital is very close to the fighting and only a few miles from the main trenches. The trenches all have different names depending on where each regiment is from. Tam, an Edinburgh boy, was telling me that his regiment, the 16th Battalion of the Royal Scots, otherwise known as McRae's Battalion, named theirs the Cowgate, Arthur's Seat in the Grass Market, he told me he used to play for the Heart of Midlothian Football Club and was one of their top goal scorers. It seems that they became the first British team to sign up en masse. All 16 of them from the same team enlisted and ended up in the same regiment. I hope they all make it back. Tam is from Leith and proudly wears a khaki-coloured tam shanter and a khaki kilt, complete with a hand-carved wooden sporran shaped like a thistle. Some of the English patients, who at first were struggling to understand my accent, are now calling me the TA, the Tartan Angel. To be honest, I don't feel very much like an angel. Angels are supposed to protect and look out for you and guarantee your safekeeping. I'm doing my very best to mend broken bodies and to try and ease the suffering. But no matter how hard I try, I can't seem to do enough. Young men are being slaughtered and blown to pieces every single day. The harsh reality being that for every boy we save, we lose about 30. December 18th. This afternoon, I had to assist with another amputation. One young soldier was hit by a mortar shell and we toiled for hours to try and save his legs. In the end he had lost so much blood and was so weak that the doctors couldn't help him. I held his hand tightly until his fingers let go. A lieutenant informed us afterwards that it had been his 19th birthday the day before. A wee while later a familiar face was stretched into the OR. He'd been here convalescing after suffering repeated headaches and tremors, the telltale signs of shell shock, and he was confined to his bed for a short time. When they transferred him to the hospital tent, his face was bound in bloody bandages. The orderly explained that he had tried to climb out of his trench, waving a white handkerchief in an attempt to surrender. After getting tangled in the barbed wire, two privates managed to pull him back, but he took matters into his own hands and shot himself with a service revolver. It seems the bullet had either misfired or malfunctioned, and it had ended up lodged in his cheek. Under an armed guard, my job was to patch him up and nurse him back to health, so that when he was well enough he could stand trial and be put up against a wall and shot again as a deserter. Afterwards, when I was clearing up, I found myself in floods of tears, 
desperately wanted to pack my bags and go home to Glasgow. And then I remembered what Matron Sally had told me on my first night. There was no time to express sympathy or mourn the dead, only to carry on tending to the wounded by the sheer strength of will. Dry your eyes, nurse. You've got a job to do. And she was right. You've been listening to The Promise by Glenn Dixon, starring Karen Fraser. This has been a Rum Diaries presentation. Wellington Way by Vivian Lamond. The old pensioner next door has an unnatural fascination with what is happening in my life since she has nothing but a telly to take up her time. You've heard of Peeping Tom. Well, I've got busy body B and I've gotten tired of her spying and sleuthing around like a wannabe Sherlock on the hunt for a heinous villain. You think I'm exaggerating. <sighs> Last Saturday, I'm in my garden out back, taking advantage of the last of the good weather, turning over the soil around the privacy fence that divides our plots. I'm hard at it, and all of a sudden, when I get this creepy feeling like I'm being watched, I stop, I look up and I spy the eye of B peeping at me through a knothole. Jesus, does she think I'm back here burying dead bodies? The next day, I got some wood cement and filled in that knothole. And just this morning... I'm washing up my breakfast dishes and there's B back at it, her spectacle eyes doing a surveillance sweep through my kitchen window. She sees me see her and ducks. Living next door to a vintage voyeur sucks. What's her problem anyway? I don't like that young ruffian who moved in next door. Wellington Way has always been a place for pensioners. Not young bachelors set on sowing their wild seeds whenever they please. Oh yes, since he came at the start of summer, I've been keeping a watchful eye. I seen the comings and goings on, his loud gin-guzzling mates and young women traipsing in and out. Why, it's a constant parade of depravity. Well, I wasn't standing for it. I rang up the police station and I shared my grievances in no uncertain terms. I was told someone would stop round, have a look-see. I'm still waiting. What do they care about an old woman? And I spoke to the landlord, Mr Carruthers. A cheesy sort of chap just champing at the bit for a chance to raise my rent. We cannot discriminate based on age, sex or gender, he says, through that fake sneering smile of his. Troy Norther's pays his rent on time. Not like your old neighbour who did a night flit when his rent was two months past due. I'm not one for letting sleeping dogs lie. I'll find that deadbeat one of these days. He'll show up on the renter's radar database. His kind always do. He throws in for good measure before he makes his way down my front stoop. Disgusting cretin of a man, that Carruthers. So, that hedonist's name is Troy Norther's. He should go back from whence he came. From the wilds of the city centre, I imagine. Then I would feel safe again. So, I'm a bachelor, OK. Not necessarily on the hunt for love, but on the hunt, if you know what I mean. It's Friday night and I meet this girl, Nellie, at a music jam. She's really cute. A free spirit retro kind of woman with a hippie chick, a boho babe vibe. We connect. And after the show, it's looking like all systems go. 
we catch an Uber and head back to my place, and I'm looking forward to a little nookie with Nelly. Just as we turn the corner of my street, there they are. Three water department vehicles, lights flashing right outside my flat. A workman flags the Uber driver down. Road closed, water main busted at 1101 Wellington Way, emergency vehicles only, he says. But I've got to get in, that's my flat, I shout. Not tonight you ain't, he answers as he hands off a business card and tells me to ring up the department in the morning and the Uber driver turns around and we head to Nelly's. I call my insurance agent and I'll leave a message. Something awful has happened next door. Emergency repair trucks everywhere. Floodlights on the back garden. Water gushing like a geezer from the ground. It's his fault, that norther's boy. Digging. Always digging. Just like that last tenant who created a crater over there when he uprooted that lovely old tree that used to shade my hostas in the summer. I've had three hours sleep and my mobile is ringing. What kind of arsehole calls up at 7am on a Saturday? I pick up. Growl a pissed off greeting. It's my insurance agent. He tells me he's going to my place straight away to assess the damage. He'll ring back later, he says. I hang up, curl up in the fetal position and try to go back into sleep mode. On Nelly's too small sofa. now. Not that it matters. I've been up all night watching. They're still at it, pumping water. The steady drone of the bilge pump is maddening. Wait, oh, they've stopped. It's gone dead quiet. has gone out to the market and I'm alone, sucking down java juice. I still haven't heard back from the insurance guy. I'm on my third cuppa and I get an incoming on my mobile. Not the insurance guy. I don't recognise the number, but I pick up anyhow. The person announces themselves and the purpose of the call. What is already bad just got worse. My nerves are shot. I feel a migraine coming on. The nausea, the searing pain in my brain. My pills. My pills. They're by the sink. I grab the bottle and the glass and turn on the tap. The water is turned off. I down my medicine without the benefit of liquid, half choking as the pills travel down my throat. I draw the blinds against the sun. I have to lie down. I have to lie down. Someone is knocking at the door. Saturday morning solicitors for some charity or other most likely. I'm not answering the door. at the police station by formal invitation to just answer a few questions, according to a certain Detective Inspector Peter McMonagall. He leads off by recounting a complaint of questionable character lodged against me a few weeks back by my nutjob neighbour. McMonagall wants to know if I have anything to say about that. Me? Questionable character? Where does that old crone get off calling me out for questionable character? I am now totally cheesed off. Do I have anything to say about her accusations? Hell yes, I counter with a tail all about bees peeking and sneaking around. He gives me the odd look and pushes on. How long have I been a tenant at 1101 Wellington Way? Four months, I answer. 
four months punctuated by a constant invasion of my privacy. McMonigal excuses himself, says he'll be back momentarily. Yeah, I know how this works. I've watched enough cop shows to know how he's got an audience behind a two-way window across that room. He's going out to have a cop confab with his cronies. I use the downtime to answer texts. One from the insurance agent and the other one from Nelly. No internal damage to my flat from the agent and an invite to an omelette dinner and extended stay rights from Nelly. <laughs> McMonagall is back. He issues a proclamation that my cooperation has been sincerely appreciated and that I'm free to go. I ask him what this is all about anyway. He answers, Good day, Mr. Nothers. We'll be in touch. Nellie picks me up and we head back to her place. I dig the water department card out of my jacket pocket and I give them a call. A cheery woman answers. I give her my address and she looks up the status of my case. I ask her how soon before I can go back to my digs. There's a hesitation before she answers. I'm so sorry, sir. That won't be possible just now, she says. Her chipper voice lowering to an almost whisper like the prelude to telling a secret. Your flat is flagged as a crime scene. What the hell? I slept all day, and my jangled nerves are the better for it. I roll up the sheet. The sun is making its descent. Next door, the house is dark. No sign of life. My eyes travel to the garden. Yellow crime scene tape everywhere. The police have finally come. Perhaps they have already found that miscreant boy guilty of some unimaginable crime. <laughs> oh, fuck it off! All right, all right, I'm coming. I call McMonagall. He's out. I'll leave a message. I am revved up and having a rant, pacing like a caged cat in Nellie's living room. Oh, she sits on the sofa, sipping her Malbec, watching the telly on mute. Captions travelling across the screen. All of a sudden, she perks up, turns up the sound. Look, she shouts. My eyes lock on the screen, and a scene I'll never forget. I know a special STV bulletin. Police have arrested Mrs B Ludlow, who has confessed to the murder of Marlon Tisdale, her former neighbour. Tisdale had gone missing from his Wellington Way residence six months ago. His body was discovered yesterday when a nearby water main burst, resulting in severe flooding which uncovered Mr Tisdale's remains. Ludlow has been denied bail. Stay tuned to STV and all the news as it happens for further updates on the story. Wow. Talk about being gobsmacked. Like, there's been a dead man dirt dwelling in my yard and a murderer living next door. What are you going to do? Nelly wants to know. Move, I answer. No way am I going to stay at 1101 Wellington Way. Eleven O One Wellington Way was written by Vivian Lamond and starred Glenn Dixon, Karen Fraser, and Titch McLean. And that's this week's show. Please look in the show notes on sonicsociety.org for the links for our features this week, and come check us out on Twitter at Sonic Society or David Alt. Be with us next week for more great audio drama from around the world or send us a note at sonicsociety at gmail.com. Until then, I'm David Alt. Have a lovely day and happy Easter. The Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. 
Thanks for listening. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Hey, Billy, why do you look so down? Aw, oh, Dad, I got a computer, a PlayStation, and a barn full of iguanas, and I'm still bored. <sighs> Gee, Billy, when I was your age, I would read lots of stories in pulp magazines. Oh, with stories of weird adventure and fantasy, horror, satire, and lots of action. That sounds great, Dad! Yeah, I sure wish there was something like that right now. <laughs> there is, Daddy-O! Who are you? I'm Dr. Mary Von Roxbrocket, host of the Twisted Pulp Radio Hour. And now there's... Yeah? Twisted Pulp Magazine! <laughs> What's that, Doctor? Why, it is a return to greatness! Available on all your digital devices. That is what it is. Look. Whoa, Dad, this looks awesome. Exciting and, dare I say it, very unwholesome. You definitely have that right, my good man. Ha <laughs> ha. Thanks, Dr. Mary. My pleasure, Billy. And just between you and me, I am not sure that this man is really your father. Bye. Dad? Uh, uh, just read your Twisted Pulp magazine, Billy. Twisted Pulp magazine! Available in dark alleyways behind meth labs everywhere! Or at digitalvaudeville.com! That is D I G I T A L V A U D E V I L L E dot com!